Welcome to my presentation on the tightness of the suffix Keats punch bound. Uh, this is a joint work with Christoph de Braunig. Um, one of the most efficient ways of building an, a MAC function or a PRF is using the full state Keats punch. The idea is that you take a sponge function and the sponge function uses a B bit permutation um, and you can absorb data with B bits at a time. The idea is that you initialize the state with a K bit key and filled with zeros, then you permute the state using this permutation and then you can absorb plain text B bits at a time. So you absorb the first plain text block, you permute, you absorb the second plain text block, you permute, etc. Until the last plain text block, then you make one more permutation call and you output the tag. So this is a very efficient PRF or MAC design. Um, it has received quite some uh, research, quite some uh, analysis has been done on this function and it is very efficient because you compress with B bits at a time where B is the size of the permutation. Now, on the downside, this function in general does not offer mode level protection against side channel attacks. This construction is not leakage resilient as you would say it. Um, as a matter of fact, the attacker can be quite powerful because if you have the key and the filled with zeros to permute, you permute, you get a secret state and the attacker has full freedom to add values to the secret state. Namely, the block P1 can be chosen by the attacker and the attacker has full freedom to manipulate uh, the state and this way it can enable, enable DPA, differential power analysis. Um, one way to solve this is to somehow limit the power that the attacker has over evaluating secret states. In this case, a secret state here can potentially be evaluated up to 2 to the b times uh, for 2 to the b different messages. If we limit this, a, a typical approach to do is using the GTM-like construction. Here we start with a key and then we have some uh, initial value or a nonce. And we look at this nonce bitwise. If the first bit is a zero, you evaluate the block cipher, a block cipher on the key and zero. If the first bit is one, you evaluate the block cipher on the key and an encoding of one. And you go on like this. So then you look at the second bit, third bit, up to the last bit. And suppose the last bit uh, appears here, so it's a one. Then you evaluate the last block cipher call on input of the key and the one. And this gives you something you can do a key stream with or um, a tag. Um, so far so good, but um, can we do this with a permutation? And one way to do this with a permutation is by using an approach that was uh, described by Taha and Shomo. Uh, in general, the idea also appears in the ISAP authenticated encryption scheme. The idea is as before, we have a B bit permutation B. We initialize the state with a key bit key, K bit key and uh, filled with the zeros, then you permute and then you absorb a nonce. But this nonce is not absorbed all at once, but you absorb it bit by bit. So you absorb the first bit, you permute, second bit, permute, up to the last bit, you permute. And if the nonce is always unique, very likely the state after absorbing the nonce is different for different nonces. And this means that at this point you can absorb with a higher rate. Here we do it R bits at a time. Um, but you can absorb with a higher rate starting from this point. Um, and the trick here is basically that in the first part, the power of the attacker to evaluate states, secret states, multiple times is limited because it can only absorb one bit at a time. And here we typically don't have um, a state that repeats a lot. Um, as a matter of fact, the, the leakage resilience of this scheme follows from the leakage resilience of the duplex that uh, Christoph and I proved three years ago. Um, but on the downside, the side channel resistance actually relies on the uniqueness of the nonce. If the nonce can, would be repeated, then you could have repeated states here and the attacker again has its power back. Okay, one alternative way of, do, of doing this is the hash then PRF construction, or more general, it's called hash then Mac. But if you take a hash function here, the idea is very simple. So the plain text is of arbitrary size. It can be hashed to get a digits of 2k bits. 
And then you evaluate the function g that should be leakage resilient on input of the secret key and this 2k bit state to get a tag t. And why do we need 2k here? Because we aim for k bit security. And a hash function allows for collisions. So if you, the attacker now makes uh, 2 to the power k evaluations, it likely finds a collision here. But if you take only a k bit state here, it only needs to make 2 to the k over 2 evaluations to find a collision. So now, leakage resilient wise or side channel protection wise, this is quite nice because the first part is not keyed. The only part that needs to protect it is the function g on input of a 2k bit input, a k bit key, and output of a t bit tag. Okay, um, only the last part needs to be protected. And if we map this idea to the sponge, we end up with what we call suffix keyed sponge, or SUX. Uh, SUX was proposed um, in general in the context of leakage resilience by the Browning et al. for ISAP v1. Um, the idea is that the plain text is first hashed using a sponge. So just a plain sponge to process the plain text. Uh, this gives you a state u at the end and only the outer k bits are then transformed using a leakage resilient PRF g. On input of a k bit key, the k outermost bits are transformed to get a k bit uh, replacement basically for the outer part. The inner b minus k bits they continue and due to this you don't need to have a 2k bit input to the function g but only a k bit input. You make one more permutation call and again then you get the tag. And three years ago we proved that SOX is leakage resilient under the assumption that G and the last evaluation of B do not leak too much information about the secret data. Um, now, in this work we focus not necessarily on leakage resilience but really on black box security. And in black box security G can be a very simple function, it can even be the XOR. Um, but it could be a more involved function as well. So what's actually the security of SOX? Um, if we take a simple case where G is an XOR and where K is a smaller than R, then this is a well-known construction. Bertoni had already described it a long time ago. And this construction, the security of this construction follows from the indifferentiability of the sponge hash function. Meaning that if, we, if the permutation is strong enough, and the mode is indifferentiable from a random oracle, then we can use this result to prove that this function sucks as a PRF. Um, however, this result does not work if G is a PRF itself, or if the key K is larger than R. And in this case, um, two years ago, uh, three years ago, we proved that sucks is a secure PRF. In detail, we proved the following bound. Um, it will appear a couple of times later on in this presentation as well. It consists of three terms. This one basically corresponds to uh, a problem if the attacker finds an inner collision in the hashing part because n is the number of permutation evaluations that the, that the attacker can make. And up to the birthday pound, um, in approximately 2 to the c over 2 evaluations, it could find an inner collision on the hash part. And if the attacker finds an inner collision on the hash part, uh, we're doomed because the attacker can find a full collision for the value u and hence create a forgery. Uh, the second part roughly corresponds to problems where the attacker guesses the outer part of a v. And the last term of the bound roughly corresponds to the, a problem if the attacker guesses the inner part of w. And this result holds under the assumption that g is 2 to the minus delta uniform, meaning that for any input the probability that it goes to a fixed output for a given for a random key is a mo is the most two to the minus delta, and g should be at most two to the should be two to the minus epsilon universal, meaning that for any two inputs to g, the probability that they collide, taken over the randomness of the key, is at most two to the minus epsilon. And this mu term is a bit of a um, um, scary term maybe, but it roughly corresponds to. Um, the probability that the large, the most likely largest multi-collision. So mu b minus k k, or in general mu b minus c c, is the smallest natural number x 
such that the probability that you have a multi-collision of size more than x is at most x over 2 to the c. And here the attacker makes q random drawings. So the probability that after q drawings you have a, a multi-collision of size larger than x is at most x over 2 to the c. And here the idea of the denominator, to denominator of 2 to the c, or in this case in the power 2 to the k, is that this loss is negligible compared to the term where the multi-collision is used. Okay, it's a scary term, but in practice it's not that big. So if you look at ASCON-like parameters, so in ASCON we have a permutation of size B, 320 bits. We have a capacity of 256 and a rate of 64. We take a key and a tag of 128. In this case, we can take the XOR as G. So the key is just absorbed by XORing into the outer part. It's 2 to the minus k uniform and 0 universal and we get a bound of this form. So 2n squared divided by 2 to the 256 plus 5n divided by 2 to the 128 plus 67n divided by 2 to the 192. If you take a PRF as g, um, a PRF is 2 to the minus k uniform and 2 to the minus k universal, we get a comparable bound. And we see that this multi-collision term is 5 here and 67 there. Where I would like to note that the first two terms in the bound are typically dominant. Also in this example, the third term gets a bigger term mu, but it has a huge denominator. So this term is not dominant in the bound. Um, now the question is, how good is this bound? How good is the bound that we derived three years ago? Uh, can we find attacks in both cases? Can we find attacks that match these bounds? Or can we maybe improve the bound of three years ago? And in this work, we investigate this problem. And in detail, we find uh, attacks matching the bounds. So in this work, we look at the tightness of this bound. Uh, first, for the first term, it's uh, non-surprising that this term is here. It corresponds to inner collisions in the hash part, and if the attacker finds an inner collision, which it can find with 2 to the c over 2 evaluations, then it can form a full collision after hashing, and it can use it to break the scheme. So that term is not surprising. Um, now the second and third term are maybe more confusing due to these multi-collisions. And in this work we investigate the tightness of these terms by mounting attacks. First we look at the case where we take the XOR as G and we derive two attacks. One is a multi-collision attack that matches the third term and one is a multi-collision attack that matches the second term. Then we look at a general case where we have a, a PRF as G and we mount a multi-collision based attack that matches the second term and um, noting that the third term is kind of independent of the function G. It doesn't use a G. Okay, let's start with the first attack. So we take the XOR as G. So it's, this is the picture that we've seen before. This is the bound that we've seen before with the difference that the last part is highlighted. Um, now G is an XOR. So you simply XOR the key into the state. And the attack goes as follows. So first we make Q construction queries for different plain text. And this results in different tags ti and it results in different states after hashing ui. So we have Q construction queries for different messages. This likely gives different uis and it gives tags ti. Now among these Q queries we try to find a multi-collision in the tags. Let's call it t. So we have mu evaluations, mu messages that led to the same t but with a different inner part of W. Now what we're going to do is we're going to make inverse queries to the permutation for guessing the outer part, the inner part of W. So we make inverse queries to P on input of the tag and we vary the inner part of W. We call it ZJ here. And at some point we will get a match. At some point we will get an answer of this, which is of the form Y, which is the outer part of V, and write b minus k ui. So at some point we get a hit between the inverse here and the inner part of u. 
because the inner part stays unchanged here. And once we have this hit, what we learned now is we learned the outer part of V for this message, for this plain text that was fed through the SOX construction. So we found a match. This means that we found, we recovered the outer K bits of V. We already know the outer K bits of U and then we can do the XOR and we get the key. And once you get the key, the scheme is of course broken. Uh, roughly the idea here is that the multi-collision in the tag gives a speed up of, the, of factor mu inserting the rightmost b minus t bits of w. And once you find the rightmost b minus t bits of w, you recovered the leftmost k bits of v, and from this you can recover the key, because you also know the leftmost k bits of u. Um, the attack is not very efficient, uh, but it does match the term in the bound. So if you take uh, an example with B256, K128, the attack has a complexity close to generic. So it's a huge online and offline complexity. Uh, but what I said, um, usually B is much more than 2K anyway, so this term is never dominating in the bound. Now the second attack, a multi-collision on the rightmost B minus K bits of U. And this is a more interesting attack because in this case we make offline evaluations of the permutation for different plain texts. So we vary the plain text here to get a mu fold collision in the rightmost B minus K bits of U. So in this part we get a mu fold collision, we call it U star. They all have a different in our outer part, a leftmost k bits here. So we get mu different plain text that result in the same inner part here, but a different outer part here. What we're gonna do now is we're gonna make a forward query to the permutation here for this value u star, but for varying z, j. And we make these evaluations, but we also made the construction queries for this mu fold collision, so we can see if we find a match in the tag. So we found the value u star, we know the mu value is t, and then we're gonna vary the leftmost k bits of v, we permute and hopefully we get a colliding tag. And in this case, we very likely found the outer part of v, the inner part, no, the outer part of v. And once we found this, it's the same as before. So we recovered the outer part of v, we already know the outer part of u, so you can add them and you get the key. So also here the idea is that a mu fold collision on the rightmost b minus k bits of u gives a speed up of mu in searching the leftmost bits of v. And once the leftmost k bits of v, and once you have this, you can recover the key. Now if you take a typical example of uh, say 272 or maybe b is 320 bits, with an aim of 128 bit security, we get a complexity, an online complexity of roughly six or two, and an offline complexity still close to generic. So it really matches the term, the corresponding term in the bound, 16n over 2, 128, or 5n over 2, 128. So of course there is a sm very small loss, but um, that's due to a bound in the multi-collision. Uh, so far so good, these attacks work if the G is an XOR. The idea is that you make evaluations that give you the outer part of U, and then you do the multi-collision attack to find the outer part of V, and because G is an XOR, you can add them and you get the key. Now if G is a PRF, the attacks don't work anymore. The reason is that if G is a PRF, or in general if G is hard to invert, invert even if you have U and V, you cannot recover the key, not necessarily recover the key. And still, it turns out that these multi-collisions, they can be used to mount a forgery against socks. And the idea is as follows, and the idea is slightly more complex. So the first step is as before, we try to find a multi-collision on the inner B minus K bits of U. So we find to, try to find mu evaluations, mu plain text P, um, and we make offline evaluations, so just permutation calls of these plain texts that find a multi collision, a mu fold collision on the rightmost b minus k bits of u. 
For each of these mu plane tags independently, we try to find a collision on the outer k bits, the leftmost k bits of u, possibly with a different inner part. Okay, so we have a mu collision on the inner part, and for each of these plane tags in this mu collision, we try to find a separate collision on the outer part. We're going to use that collision later on. Now, for this mu construction queries of the multi collision, we compute the corresponding tags. So we compute the corresponding tags. We know that these are mu different tags, very likely, but we know that they all had the same inner part here, the same rightmost b minus k bits. What we're going to do now is we're going to recover the leftmost k bits of v. So we're going to vary the leftmost k bits of v, we call it cj here, we evaluate the permutation until we get a match against t. And in this case we found for one of the plain texts in this mu fold collision, we recovered the leftmost part of v. Um, but the cool thing now is that we go back to the individual collision that we found in step 2. So for this plain text we recovered the leftmost k bits of v, but we also know a different plain text that happens to have an identical leftmost part of u. And because g is hard to invert we cannot recover the key, but still we know that for this colliding message it has the same left part, hence it will have the same right part left part of it has the same left part of u hence it will have the same left part of v um, and the right part where well, we can compute it because we can make this evaluation offline and hence we already know what tag this plain text will give so we mount a forgery so the trick is that we have a multi collision using this multi collision we recover the value v for one of them and for this one, we will find a normal collision on the outer part of U, and hence we can find a forgery. Uh, this is in general the collision structure that we have. So on the left part of the slide, you see the multi collision. So we have mu evaluations, P1, P2, up to P mu, that all collide on the rightmost B minus K bits. It says B minus S, but in general it's B minus K. And for each of these plain texts, we find a separate collision on the leftmost bits. Okay, and in general, if you look at the attack, um, it turns out that I'm going to go over it quickly. We get the same numbers as the attack that we had for the XOR of G. And this corresponds to the fact that we, uh, the, the finding the separate collisions don't add too much work. And um, to conclude, we prove tightness of the attacks. It turns out that the attack complexity is similar if G is an XOR or if G is a PRF. Um, the multi collisions that we saw in the security bound that we found in our security proof, there are no artifacts of the proof. They actually have a meaning because there are attacks that match these multi collision terms. In the paper, we elaborate uh, in more detail about in, uh, into the attack complexity. So we actually compute a success probability of the attack. Um, there is still a very small loss in the bound due to the bounding of multi collisions uh, in general. Uh, but this is only a very small constant loss, but still it will be interesting to see how we can improve this. Uh, this concludes my presentation. Uh, thank you for watching.